So I welcome all of you to this lecture uh, series and today's topic. So we have Professor Girish Nath Jha. I will give a brief uh, biography from of my Professor Jha. Professor Girish Nath Jha is currently the chairman of the Commission for Scientific and Technology in the Tamil Nadu of Government of India. He is a professor of computational linguistics and Robert University at the School of Sanskrit and Hindi Studies. He is also a founder and faculty at the School of Engineering, Center of Linguistics, and at the Special Center of Learning in Vienna. Professor Jha has served as the chairperson of the Special Center of Sanskrit Studies in and was the founding dean of the School of Sanskrit and Hindi Studies at Vienna. He has also been the position of the director of international collaboration and as coordinator of biology program. His research interests include Indian languages, corpora and standards, Sanskrit and Hindi linguistics, lexical character, science and technology in Sanskrit, machine translation, e-learning, various technologies, artificial techniques, software design, and programmation. Professor Jha has done collaborative research and technical for Hindi uh, studies, University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, USA, as Nutrition and Pretty Chapter Distinguished Professor of History and Science during 2009 He was awarded Dart Fellowship in 2014 and 2016 to teach digital and technology at the University of Wurzburg, Germany. And has also been a positive citizen of and to the Yogyakarta State University of Indonesia. He has been awarded the Pratapita Asthana Vidya Award for Sanskrit and the PSTSS Award for Reviving Sharada School. Professor Jar Vikis came in and he and EAB in linguistics, computational linguistics from JAD and then got another master degree. In linguistics, natural language interference interface from the University of Illinois, Arbona, Champaign, USA, in 1999. He worked as software engineer and software development specialist in the US before joining the in 2002. Professor Jha has books published as Lingard, English scholar publishing among others, and has over 150 research papers, presentations, and more than 300 invited talks. He has supervised 43 engagement and 43 engagement students so far. Professor Jha has had consultancies, including those from Google, Google, 50, Microsoft Research, Microsoft Corporation, Linguistic Data Consulting, University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, EZ, DR, among others. Professor Jha has completed several sponsored projects for Indian language technology development. And has made a consortium of 17 university institutes for developing corporal and standards for Indian languages. As you can understand with this biography, the he is a very Indian person and more figure in Sanskrit and uh, original and studying Sanskrit language and as well as technology. So I uh, humbly request Professor Jha to take over this lecture and enlighten us with whatever he has to offer. Thank you, Professor Cha, for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Soham. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, you can see my screen uh, and also screen changing. Yes. Good, good. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, I T Rurki, Soham, and uh, Gauri Shankarji for inviting me to this uh, lecture series on personality development through Sanskrit. And uh, very aptly, I guess, uh, you have uh, titled uh, the series as uh, Personality Development Through Sanskrit. The Sanskrit does help, you know, and, uh, and the best uh, part of it is that it uh, instills a lot of confidence uh, in, in students who have gone through some Sanskrit at, at some level. What I'm going to talk about is uh, something which will interest uh, most of the engineering uh, students. So I thought I'll perhaps take uh, this topic. 
and throw some light on the origin of uh, linguistic studies in India and uh, and uh, in, of course, Europe and America, leading towards the formal language studies. Uh, and formal language studies, uh, uh, when we talk about that, we talk about artificial grammars, uh, compilers, etc., cetera, et cetera. So uh, the central problem, those of you who have done uh, some course in AI, uh, in AI is that uh, we have to make sure machines understand natural language, right? And uh, AI can happen only if machines understand natural language texts. Now, natural language texts are, uh, are very complex, and uh, they have layers of structures and embedded meaning, which has to be determined either locally or, or mostly elsewhere. The meaning is not present in the sentence. It might be determined with the help of sentences before, sentences after, might be pages after. And the length of the sentence is a variable that uh, you'd be surprised to know that a natural language sentence actually can run into pages. There's one sentence in Sanskrit that perhaps would be the longest sentence in human history is Kadambari. Kadambari is a novel in the 7th century written by Barnabhatta. That uh, novel has one word, or rather a sentence, running into 38 pages. So you can imagine uh, the amount of uh, linguistic jugglery uh, that can actually go into constructing a sentence. And similarly, the amount of computing power uh, and the smartness needed for machine to you know, unpack everything as per the structures. So uh, theoretically, uh, and also practically, natural languages have proven to be very, very complex. And uh, until that happens, machines uh, uh, are not able to understand natural language text, and machines cannot be considered intelligent if they don't understand natural language text. Now, all through the history of evolution of uh, intelligent computing, uh, you'll see that the language has been at the center stage. What is uh, encryption, decryption, they might be artificial exercises, but also natural language ex exercise. And in Sanskrit, people uh, uh, you know, uh, reveled in uh, encrypting and decrypting, uh, making Sanskrit artificial. And of course, uh, neurolinguistics, uh, machine translation 50s uh, was the hallmark. Uh, this is when AI term was not formally coined, you know, uh, machine translation was already there. The machine translation came and went and they failed and there was a critical review of it. 60s, uh, we'll, we moved towards more theoretical informatics, complexity and natural language parsing was considered a very interesting uh, object, of, uh, object for parsing. Uh, and uh, so psycholinguistic interpretations of parsers, generators in the 70s when Prolog was uh, invented in 1972. And, uh, and, uh, and so there was a fashionable uh, time to actually use uh, um, logic uh, in programming and it gained popularity in the following decade also. So the idea was uh, that if human beings are able to parse natural languages effortlessly 24-7, uh, why do machines have difficult, uh, difficulty in doing that? So it is a nice word, the logic, inference, unification, of course, and natural language interfaces uh, by multimodal interfaces. So language is a center stage, actually, you can see. And, and with the, the uh, last two decades, uh, or rather, we are the third decade now, so uh, the web became very important, and the natural language data started appearing in, in, in in large quantities, and uh, we started calling it big uh, data and big language data. I call it big linguistic data. And with phenomenal progress in computing, uh, and also uh, the fact that AI has been uh, changing rapidly since the 90s, the future, uh, we can very well say which way this is going to go is not very sure. But, but AI will be important, AI will be needed, but how AI will be done will be certainly uh, uh, very, very difficult to predict as of now. So uh, if you talk about language structures being, being fundamental, being foundational in AI, then we have to consider uh, how closely they are related with uh, uh, AI. So if you talk about understanding language, we talk about understanding sounds. I'm speaking to you in sounds, right? The sounds are innumerable uh, in each language, and, and uh, the combinations they can undergo are also in, in, innumerable. And uh, uh, we have to understand how sounds are defined, how sounds combine, 
how sounds make syllables and how syllables are used to make words and we use words in communication. So entire communication engineering actually it concern, is concerned with the phonetics and phonology to areas and most of the dialogue recognition systems, you know, Google Assistant, you know, and Siri, Amazon Alexa, they're all bothered about how to capture sounds, right? And if you are a good uh, linguist, uh, knowing a lot of phonetics and phonology, and you also know machine learning, I'm sure you have a good uh, opportunities of jobs in, in the industry. Morphology syntax are primarily uh, concerned with the structures of words and sentences. And because the meanings are, uh, you know, uh, semantics, meanings are uh, the semantic studies, and uh, you cannot understand the meaning of uh, an utterance or a sentence or a word without actually understanding the internal structures that are there. So all of these uh, five areas are actually, there are more actually pragmatics, you know, when we use sentence in a context, the context determines the meaning of the sentence. So pragmatics also becomes important. So all of these are uh, critical in actually, uh, in, in artificial intelligence. And therefore, a natural language understanding is a core area of AI today, that we have to make sure machine understands natural language with little effort. So we cannot have, uh, the, the, we cannot have uh, the, the, the luxury of training large language models in every human language because they may not be an uh, equitable uh, quantity of corpora and resources in every language, right? So we have to think about something more deeper deeper insights into language structures and language universalism. For example, we train a system for language X and can that system be used for language Y? For example, chat GPT trained on English language, can that be used for Gondi? Can that be used for Garhawali, right? So all of these have to uh, be answered and, and uh, with significant effort in research, you know, how languages behave, how languages operate on certain, on, on certain levels. Now, then uh, taking a little earlier, because uh, linguistic studies uh, evolved from Sanskrit, and Sanskrit is the, the oldest language in the human history which had an elaborate system of linguistic studies. And the, the oldest date that can go uh, for Sanskrit could be, I would say, approximately 5000 BCE, so that would mean at least 7500 years, because Mahabharata's date now is approximately 3800 BCE. So you can at least posit 2,000 years before Mahabharata for the Rig Veda. So 5, 6,000 BCE would be the Rig Veda. And that is the oldest text in Sanskrit and oldest text in any human language composed in such fluent you know, uh, 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 language. So Rig Veda is, is a mature piece of literature. And we do not have any literature in human history as old as Rig Veda. So, uh, and to, main, to make sure that literature, uh, the Vedic literature continued for generations. And that was all oral tradition. So we had to evolve sound linguistic disciplines. Therefore, Vedangas were constructed and there were six Vedangas and four out of six Vedangas were actually linguistic sciences. So you may have heard of uh, Vedangas like Vyakarana, Nirukta, Chanda, you know, and, and Shiksha, Vyakaran is grammar, Chanda is metrics, Nirukta is etymology, and Shiksha is phonetics. So four of, of the six Vedangas, two were the Kalpa and Jyotisha. Kalpa and Jyotisha were not directly related to linguistics, but uh, remaining four were linguistic sciences, core linguistic sciences. And without a knowledge of these core linguistic sciences, you cannot afford to understand Vedic texts. Why? Because Vedic texts will undergo changes, the language will undergo change. The Vedic texts will be the, the sacrosanct, the same, but language would have changed over a period of time. So now I am 1000 years down the line from the Rig Veda and I'm trying to re read Rig Veda, I'll not be able to understand. And so I had Parani a difficulty. Parani was 7th century BCE and he says there are two sets of languages, Laukiki, my current language, and Vedaki, the historical language. So for historical language, he has a different set of grammar rules. So therefore, <laughs> grammar is very critical. And since everything was in oral tradition, Ucharana was very critical. Phonetics was very critical. As since, since words are changing meanings, etymology was very critical. If I find, if I'm Panini, 7th century BCE, and you are a Vedic Rishi in 5000 BCE, 
and you have constructed uh, used some word in uh, Rig Vedic Sukta and I'm not able to understand I'm 4000 years later so I will use some grammar mechanism to go back to that original word it's also a very important tool in historical linguistics and also a very important tool in understanding the original words right and trying to fix the meaning of words so etymology was very important and then Khanda was very important because every Rig Vedic Sukta is is, is you know uh, constructed as per as per a meter you can sing entire entire Rig Veda but by singing you remember more so singing was a device so that you are able to remember more even if you don't understand the meaning you're able to remember it and you can pass it on to the successive uh, generations so this was the strategy in ancient India to construct everything in sutraic form in melodious uh, form so that you can sing it as, as, as a text and you can you know uh, pass it on to the generations so we sang mathematics, we sang like computer science, we sang Ayurveda, we sang everything. So entire Pani's text, which is a set of 4,000 sutras, is a song you can sing in two hours, right? So you cannot remember perhaps the 4,000 sutras of Pani that they don't make sense to you immediately, but you can remember them as a song. We sing songs even if we don't understand the meaning. So there was a strategy. So four out of six Vedangas were very brilliantly constructed as as, as, you know, as linguistic sciences. So linguistic sciences were very core and critical discipline in ancient India. And therefore, Panini, I've already mentioned, Panini is uh, the center stage because Panini is, is the first grammar in human history which completely documents any human language. And that documentation is still true for Sanskrit. That's another miracle, right? And Sanskrit, of course, is uh, a tradition which is huge in, in every discipline you talk about. You talk about language, you talk about literature, you talk about natural sciences, mathematical sciences, logical sciences, philosophies, and, 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 the, and the science of, science of uh, uh, sex, um, uh, you know, dictionaries, everything on earth you can find in Sanskrit. You can find even books on, on you know, horses, elephants, Gaj Ayurveda, Ashu Ayurveda, right? And, and cuisines, everything you can, you can imagine. So uh, the Sanskrit is a huge discipline and all of that language was constructed as for a system. And that system was the oral tradition uh, which had to be constructed using uh, uh, Shiksha Shastra, Shiksha Pradeshakya. There are about more than 100 Shiksha Shastras available. My students have translated at least two or three, or, uh, least 10 of them actually, which were not translated earlier. And we have edited at least 10 of them. So uh, there are more than 100 of them and then, you know, uh, there was a whole tradition of uh, grammars, whole tradition of metrics. So every Vedanga has a tradition of, of Shastra, right? And, and then there'll be uh, all the way from uh, the Vedic times down to current times, people have been writing. So this is one language which has the oldest intellectual tradition, oldest continuing intellectual tradition. So thinking of Sanskrit, knowing Sanskrit, you feel, you know, you feel very confident. You feel, you know, uh, that you are certainly from part of a very important intellectual tradition. And uh, you should be proud of that. Now, uh, talking about uh, Sanskrit and AI, so there was a, a, a research article in AI magazine in 1985. It was titled Knowledge Representation in Sanskrit in Artificial Intelligence. Can everybody see this uh, uh, pop-up uh, window? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Can you see this article on PDF? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Great. So this was done by Rick Briggs, which, who was at that time a NASA researcher. And he, he, uh, he says the following. He says that there has been a tradition in India, uh, uh, it's called, you know, uh, to, which converts in natural language uh, uh, strings into artificial, artificial unambiguous strings. The tradition of Navaniyai, Mimansa, Shabdabod. He says that the, it's important for AI community to first read the Sanskrit tradition and see what they have done, how they have done. The whole problem in AI is that uh, machines will understand only things which are unambiguous or formally represented. And natural language is not like that. But there is a method in Navinyai, the, the neologic in India, uh, which uh, represents natural language strings artificially, unambiguously. And they have been doing it because they had to make sense. They had to make sense of every text unambiguously, Shastraic text. So this was a very normal practice in India, in Indian intellectual tradition, that before we try to understand a text, we try to make sense of it, right? The sharp, the bodh, you have to make sense of, of a literature, a text. Yeah, there's a clear method of doing that. So what he says that if there's a system of doing that in India, why not first read that and start from there on? 
There's no need to reinvent the wheel if some tradition, some culture like India has already done it. Let's read that first and then see what needs to be done new in, in artificial intelligence. So that paper made a lot of headlines in India and, and there were a lot of uh, uh, debate in parliament, discussion in parliament. And, and I guess, uh, I guess the, 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 um, something that started in CDAC um, uh, on these lines, uh, you know, documenting Indian texts, etc. at that time. I'm not very really sure about that. Another, another uh, document which is uh, talking about Sanskrit as the foundation for computational linguistics. And, uh, and this uh, paper was again uh, um, presented in one of the seminars in IIT Bombay uh, in 2001. And Sanskrit studies as a foundation for computational linguistics. As since computational linguistics is actually the, the mother of artificial intelligence. So you can say Sanskrit as, as the foundation for AI. And he has his own argument. Uh, uh, and then I recommend everybody to actually uh, read these two important articles and papers uh, uh, know, uh, to actually go into, to initiate themselves into this discipline. Now talking about uh, the three very important linguists uh, who uh, shaped these developments. You know? uh, so I'll, I'll first mention Panini, which is, uh, who is uh, 7th century BCE. Then I'll, I'll, I'll mention Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, who is 19th century. And then Chomsky uh, was just was 20th, 20th century. Noam Chomsky, excuse me. So uh, talking about Panini, why Panini is important. Uh, Panini's uh, grammar is called Ashtadhyayi, uh, grammar of Sanskrit, uh, uh, which is in, uh, you know, uh, 4,000 sutras. 4,000 sutra as the, as the front end. And then there are 2,000 uh, verb roots as a grammar. It's called Dhatupat. Uh, and then and then Ganapat and all, all these modules they interact uh, with each other. So why is Panani important? Because Panani first of all conceived uh, a kind of a, a formal mechanism could be used for something like human language. And he constructed a grammar which was modular and in, in a sense that there'd be no sequential processing but simultaneous processing. You know, and then uh, these uh, components, for example, the phonetic component the sounds, because we speak in sounds, we talk to each other in sounds, and the way brain, human brain processes our communication, he gave a model. He says that we first speak in sounds to each other, so human brain has a, has a, has a sound catalog, and from the sound catalog, the, the, the variables are uh, uh, derived and the lists are produced, and those lists interact uh, against, uh, uh, on, on some other lists, and some, some you know, uh, formal mechanisms are ordained to you know, uh, uh, parse them. And then uh, after uh, these sounds are captured by brain, uh, so far we don't know for sure how human brain actually captures the sounds, but certainly uh, something can be uh, uh, said about that. You should have good ears, you should have good coordinated mind, etc., etc. But after the sounds are captured by brain, uh, then the grammar rules act on them to parse, to make sense of, of the utterance. And in the process, we need a lexicon of the language. And we need two lexicons, the lexicon of nouns, entities, and lexicon of verbs. And these two are external. These two are not part of the uh, Parani grammar. These are outside, just like you know, a good uh, uh, quality, a good quality uh, RDBMS, which needs to be accessed uh, using a certain you know, a data transfer protocol from, from, the, uh, from the front end. So uh, these lexica are uh, a uh, word database called Dhatupata. And the nominals, Ganapat. Uh, Ganapat are the stems, the stems, you know, a basis. And then there are small lists which are part of the front end part of the Parani's uh, Sutra part. So typically, in a good program, we keep uh, databases out, we keep uh, any bigger lists out, and we keep smaller lists inside. And in a good program, we start with creating variables, macros, 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 and then we iteratively use the macros in our functions and classes, right? And before any function is, uh, uh, you know, uh, evaluated, uh, uh, those keywords in the functions are to be evaluated first, right? If, it, if there's any problem, if a keyword is not instantiated earlier, then there'll be a compilation error. You all know that, right? So something similar happens finally in much more, much more, you know, qualitative way. So Parani system is much more formal, and I would say uh, largely unambiguous. I wouldn't say Parani's grammar is 100% unambiguous. And uh, since it is largely unambiguous, it is easier to program Parani Sutras, right? The structure is uh, very similar to a good program. 
and uh, in what uh, 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 we have to first uh, instantiate variables like first sutra panani says vriddhi radhej now vriddhi radhej is uh, looks like sanskrit but it is not sanskrit it's written in uh, it is i mean now you it was earlier a song oral tradition but now it is written you will read this in devanagari sanskrit but looks like sanskrit but it is not sanskrit so what they have done they have used the sanskrit conventions or sanskritic conventions sanskrit syntax for example sanskrit uh, uh, letters for example have constructed an artificial language something similar we use english syntax and english uh, uh, alphabets to to construct uh, java c python etc right but a code in java is not english a code in python is not english but looks like english similarly pani's grammar the 4000 sutras if you read through if you know very good sanskrit you cannot understand it you have to know the technical code of panin to make sense of panin's grammar if you are a c programmer then only you can understand c code you may be good in english but you cannot understand c code so you may be very good in sanskrit but you cannot understand panin's grammar because it is artificial construction based on sanskrit see the ideas for programming language you can see right and and so panini creates variables and dynamically assigns values to variables for example there are two kinds of variables i say integer x equals 5 but panini won't say that he would create a list he will name a variable create a list and the values will be assigned dynamically so the dynamic lists are being created as variables you know so for example vriddhi for example first sutra panini says vriddhi ra dai vriddhi at h so vriddhi is a vriddhi is a the sound a and h a i a i vriddhi is a i so vriddhi is a i he says it means these sounds are called vriddhi now how do you obtain that so there is a sound catalog of shiva sutra shiva sutra has 14 sutras again mechanically uh, formally arranged catalog of, of sounds and a program runs on those sounds and builds this these lists so adi ranten sahita there is another program which runs on this list of sounds and generates these variables and fills fills these variables assigns values to variables right and and then you have to actually expand continuously so to understand any sutra if i am a human compiler i am trying to i am a sanskrit person and i don't know panini's grammar i have to first know the techniques of panini's grammar then i read a sutra and expand and try to understand it in trying to understand it i have to expand so if there are you know, macros used a key terms used in the sutra we have to supply replace those keywords with their values so rule replacement procedures left hand side equals right hand side right and so uh, just to be continuous expansion and the fact that panini has used vriddhi radesh as the first sutra in his grammar There are two implications. First, that Mangala Charan in Indian tradition, we always believe in expansion, 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 growth, progress. That's one thing. Second, Parni is saying that to understand my grammar, you have to continuously evaluate, expand, 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 by putting, replacing the stock variables with their values continuously. And that happens in a programming language. If you have constructed a code, the compiler will evaluate it. Runtime evaluation will also happen. All of that. So the phrase structure rules and replacement procedures may have been thoroughly influenced by Panini. Now people have actually claimed that, and as you will see later. But in India, I, I'm, I'm surprised that the the engineering departments are not teaching Panini. And if if uh, they believe me, if they have a course on Panini in computing in every engineering school, I'm sure students will benefit a lot more from the the techniques of Panini. You know how to construct a, a statement which is unambiguous. Let's see some quotations on Panini from the Sterners. Leonard Bloomfield was, or I think, still is considered the father of American structuralism. His famous book *Language* came out in 1929, and uh, uh, he says uh, in that uh, the introduction of that book, the descriptive grammar of Sanskrit, which Panini brought to its perfection, because there were nine grammarians before before Panini, is one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence. He says there is one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence, Panini's grammar. He says. and an indispensable model for the description of languages it does not say natural language only so if you have to describe either natural language or artificial language panini's model is indispensable you cannot avoid using panini panini's technique in describing a natural or artificial language so can anybody who is doing you know compiler design can say 
that he's not using Panini. That would be grossly, a grossly uh, mistake. And then, the, but it's surprising that the, in computer science departments, even in India, I'm, sur I'm, I'm surprised that people do not do not do not teach Panini. Panini's grammar. I was in I was in Florence University, having dinner with the HOD of the linguistics department, and I was trying to boast Panini that we do Panini uh, in, in JNU, and what she said that we teach Panini here. <laughs> they teach Panini even in Florence. But I'm so surprised that the computer department don't don't teach. Now, uh, now uh, this is a quotation from Encyclopedia Britannica. I'll just uh, read the uh, uh, you know uh, highlighted uh, portion. The grammar of Astadhyayi has been likened to the Turing machine, an idealized mathematical model that reduces the logical structure of any computing device to its essentials. So, in Panini's grammar, the the parsing or derivation does not stop till you have hit the dead end. So, for example, bhavati, if you have to parse bhavati, you continue parsing, 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 till there is nothing more to parse. You have obtained the minimum, bare minimum, which is the dhatu or the root, bhu. And similarly, if you have to construct, if you have to speak, when you speak, you construct an output. When you have to understand, you parse an output, no, uh, input, right? You parse an input to language understanding, you produce an output for language generation. In both the cases, the derivation will continue till there is something to derive. And Pandit Gamba does exactly like that and does it to its perfection. And another ceremony, Williams, uh, the uh, famous guy uh, uh, for constructing the dictionaries. Uh, uh, the great linguist Pandit gave the concept of meta language. To meta language, the term, uh, the concept first appears in Pandit's Gamba, which he used, which he cannot. Uh, uh, not used in computer science, meta language and engineering. The meta language was constructed 1000 of years before the computer scientists began exploring the same idea. And he says, no one has been able to match him to this day and he's early 20th century Moria Williams. I'm sure if you evaluate the engineering sciences today, I'm sure they would have uh, perhaps done uh, as good as Parani has done, or perhaps even bettered him, I don't know, but till this time, he says no one has perfected him, no one has matched him to this date. So why is Parani's computing is important in computing? Because explicit formal mechanisms are described by him for almost anything, even natural languages. The most critical and, and difficult aspect of artificial intelligence is to capture natural language. And he has given a very clear method, a way how to capture it. That's why Parani is important in our kind of computing, AI computing. So Pandi has imported, uh, impacted core areas of linguistics and computing, and I'll mention those. And some examples of why Pandi has impacted core areas, some examples of good programming from Pandini. So uh, as I said, uh, he, he generates dynamic lists on the fly. So whenever lists are needed, lists are built and then destroyed. So for example, I, I, I fetch a data set uh, uh, I, I need a data set uh, from database. I'll, I'll run a custom query and obtain data set and display it if it doesn't need to display, display it and then, you know, uh, uh, disband it. I disband it so uh, memory is conserved. So exactly the same way Pandi does it. He does not uh, keep the data set ready all the time. When needed, then only. Otherwise, uh, no need. Uh, the card is, is like an, uh, importing an API. So if I say, you know, uh, import uh, java.sql, so I'm actually importing a package which will be used to communicate with the database, right? So Pani does something similar. He has uh, these techniques of importing APIs and also code blocks and commenting. This has a term called anuvritti, which is uh, iteration and recursion, repeated, you know, uh, 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 processing uh, 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 from inside, inside a function. Uh, Paribhasha is a meta rules and also conflict resolution. If two rules apply to a string and thereby generate two outputs, which one is the winning candidate? So Panini says, if, if by chance but there's a rule sequencing and you cannot guarantee the correct, correct rule sequence for every, every particular string which you have to parse, so it's possible that more than one rule apply. If more than one rule apply, then certainly there'll be more than one output and that case machine will hang. So in that, Pandey says, there's a, board, there's a brute force. He says, the rule which comes later gives you the better output. So you just take over, uh, take that and, and move ahead, which might be technically wrong, which might be wrong also. But he says, we have no option. 
<laughs> there are two outputs of equal nature. You just take the one which comes later. And that, uh, that interpretation has been uh, became controversial recently with this guy uh, uh, called uh, some, some Rishi, uh, some Rishi Pope, whatever. Uh, he uh, misunderstood the whole concept and came up with a thesis which has been criticized. Anyway, so and then there are uh, Sanya, then the other part is actually a database, uh, which I said is an RDBMS very, uh, very complex uh, uh, database based on semantic concepts. You're looking at, you know, uh, a semantic web and all that, and here we have uh, Astadhyayi, which is with the Dhatu part database. By the way, Dhatu part and database sounds to me cognate that they're similar words, you know, similar sounding words. And then uh, uh, Sanya uh, sutras are there, uh, which you instantiate variables and you assign uh, 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 values to them. And then Atidesh, you extend the scope of a rule. If a rule's scope is uh, uh, appearing to be uh, uh, constricted, you suddenly bring in a sutra and expand the scope of a rule to accommodate uh, newer examples, newer kinds of data, right? And, and, and of course, uh, 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 this could be used uh, uh, very interestingly in machine learning. You know that um, if uh, the predictions are, are too narrow and then you can perhaps uh, broaden the scope of prediction uh, and classification. With the, uh, the uh, we trigger uh, operation, with the are basically the operation rules and uh, and when all, everything is in place, you start do the operation. Operation is in the form of A goes to B in the context of C. So that is the uh, operation uh, sutra, if then else. And the Nehemiah restriction, you restrict the, if the rule is too broad, you uh, restrict its operation. Uh, so Nehemiah, you know, and Nishadha has negation. So these are some of the uh, examples of the many, many more. I haven't actually uh, given uh, the entire list. So uh, there's another uh, important linguist uh, who happened uh, perhaps you know, uh, more than 2,000 years after Pandini, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure. Uh, he was a linguist from Switzerland and he studied, he still did PhD in Sanskrit and uh, that too in Karaka. Karaka is perhaps the most mature uh, component of Pandini's Gamba. Someday uh, uh, I'll have uh, maybe opportunity to talk about Karaka to you. That'll be interesting to advanced students. Now, he lectured on Sanskrit and Indo-European at the University of Geneva for three decades and uh, may have been certainly influenced by Pandani. Bhartri Hari is a grammarian who came after Pandani, about 7th century AD, I believe. And, uh, uh, and his idea of signify, signified somewhat resembles the notion of Sphota. The Sphota is a, a theory started with Patanjali and then matured in Bhartri Hari. And he talks about when we speak a word, how the mind actually brain processes. So when I say cow, does the meaning of cow uh, immediately flash in the brain the moment you started saying cow, k, or it completes when you have completed the word? Does the brain predict a word, a meaning, before the, the sentence has been completed? And we all do that. We know that. You're saying something before you have completed I have understood. Right? So that kind of prediction theory, <laughs> this photo I is talking about, and... Uh, so uh, this is for a theory of India was popularized by Ferdinand de Saussure. Noam Chomsky, uh, uh, you must have heard about that. Uh, Chomsky in hierarchy is very important. Uh, type uh, zero, type one, two, three uh, grammars. He gave four uh, classes of formal grammars. Now he has moved to University of Arizona. He was in MIT uh, since 55. And he is known for his, uh, his you know, foundational theories of universal grammar, transformational grammar, cognitivism and nativism. And, and successfully destroying the behaviorist uh, uh, theory by uh, B.F. Skinner. And he, uh, he gave a hierarchy of grammars, uh, which is called Chomsky hierarchy. If you compare uh, uh, Panini, um, if, uh, Chomsky in his grammar, I think the first syntactic structures, and the book he came out with in 57, he, he mentions in the introduction uh, Panini. He mentions Panini was also a generative grammarian. He does not say that he himself is the first generative grammarian. He says Parani is also a generative grammarian, which means Parani is the first generative grammarian because there's no one before Parani who wrote a grammar, right? So, uh, so if you compare uh, Parani's grammar with Chomsky's model, let's see. So two books, 57, syntactic structures. Uh, how much time do I have more? Hello? Hello? Yeah, how much time do I have, sir? Uh, I don't know, five minutes. Five, ten minutes. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll speed up then. So uh, if you see this grammar, uh, 
So he says that human brain has uh, this module, you know, a module which you know has a uh, free structure rules and lexicon. In Pani, it is the sutra part and dhatu part, gana part, which gives you parsing, and then uh, you apply meaning, karaka component of Pani, and then you go to the uh, understanding. Uh, then you basically, and then you apply three rules, uh, you transform, and you get a separate structure. So this is back and forth is happening. You know, uh, the the two way communication happens using this this way. And if you compare uh, Panini with uh, the context free grammar, so uh, those of you have uh, known type 2 grammar, so uh, you know uh, the G is uh, V T P S, and uh, so uh, non terminals, terminals, productions, and a star symbol. And non terminal is basically part of these categories of, of the um, English like language, English and English like language. Panini, we have a sovereign, etc., as the more complex, more complex non terminals. So Parnish government produces a much more complex and, and well knit structure than, than Chomsky can ever even imagine. Terminals is a words like the dog, uh, cat, etc. And finally we have the sounds as well as as well as you know the verb roots. And production would be A of the A um, goes to alpha and finally is, um, goes A goes to B if C. And start symbol is the utterance uh, in Chomsky, and start symbol is actually the vivaksha, the desire to speak. In, 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 in Panini, which is much more, much more complex. If you compare Panini with the Bacchus nor form BNF, uh, so you see this uh, formula. Uh, so this notation system, you S goes to NPVP, we have Pada in Panini goes to Supa and Thing, Supa Thing and Pada. You have a noun phrase going to Det and N, and you have Sanya Pad, uh, Sanya flanked by, uh, to the left side, the uh, abstract entities and verb similarly, uh, Kriya Pad flanked by uh, abstract entities to the left and right. While Kriyapad word phrase is uh, simple uh, in, in Chomsky. And uh, nouns are uh, any word in the dictionary. Here, nouns could be inflected entities, as well as actually, you know, sometimes more complex entities. And similarly, verbs could be uh, the verb roots as well. So, this is how uh, you know, the uh, uh, comparison is with BNF. And so, from Pandani to Sasu to Chomsky to computational linguistics, and of course to AI, there's a very clear direction. So idea obviously came from uh, Panini, and there was one gentleman, uh, 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 Peter Jelahi Ingerman, who wrote to ACM in 1967, uh, arguing for uh, Panini backers form. He says it was Panini who uh, uh, discovered this for the first time, and therefore we should give credit to Panini. And it should be called Panini backers form. He gives his argument by you know after reading uh, Sanskrit text and Panini grammar, and then he came up with all the details of. Why Pani should get the credit. In fact, the first language, Algol, which came as early as the 50s, had very clear impact of Panian methods. Now, if we talk about the similarity of methods in Sanskrit, in, in, in computer science, uh, 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 in AI, so you'll find a lot of uh, similarity. So, Sanskrit uses methods like quantitative, descriptive, and generative, and linguistics uses the same methods in its own way quantitative, experimental, observational, feedback, corporate, etc. And in the comparison linguistics AI, you will use all relevant methods from linguistics, CS, Sanskrit, etc., and add methods from database and programming, and then add corpora based techniques, and of course, uh, machine learning uh, as well. And if you, if you look at uh, the, the, the classical method in, in AI, which used formal grammar and lexicon, so you can, you can construct a grammar, uh, something like this, you know, uh, which I constructed from my master's thesis at UIUC. So uh, you will construct macros first, uh, and then you use the macros to construct uh, grammar, and the grammar will be fed by a lexicon, which will be constructed as per the same method. And this is exactly the same way what Parnani does, constructs macros, then uses macros to construct rules and dictionaries. And these days we have actually uh, 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 jumped to the machine learning uh, methods, uh, training large language models, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, if I have time. So uh, today the method has moved to uh, machine learning uh, based algorithms and uh, uh, we train a lot of uh, uh, you know, algorithms with a lot of data, supervised, uh, semi-supervised, unsupervised and with, with varying degrees of results. Now considering the whole background of, of this you know, uh, linguistic strength of India, it's, 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 uh, it's, possible, it's potential to, to create you know, uh, a more robust AI for our country. We have this you know, education policy which has a, a, a promise that we will deliver a content in Indian uh, mother tongues to the entire nation and that cannot be possible without AI. Because unless we have machine translation, we cannot deliver education to all our people in their mother tongue. 
So focus on mother tongue is there and uh, at least at the primary level and we have to construct a lot of data in each Indian language, which is not possible without automatically translating content from those languages which have content. India's complex linguistic situation, you all know that we have so many languages uh, uh, and uh, everything is multilingual, media, movies, TV, you know, print, uh, newspapers, education, language policy, education policy, everything is plural. And we need uh, AI, multilingual, efficient AI in all of these domains in India. And this cannot happen if we just keep on importing the alien algorithms and data sets and methods which may not apply to all languages in India across. So can we implement NEP without technology? We perhaps cannot. And we have to develop uh, uh, content in all Indian languages. We have to develop uh, vocabulary in all Indian languages. And that is not possible without using technology. So what exactly we do, uh, Commission for Scientific and Technical Terminology, which I'm heading uh, now. Um, we do uh, vocabulary, terminology, uh, technical uh, terminology created in all languages. And then we have our Granth Academies in all the states which create content and textbooks uh, to, to be used by, uh, by universities. This is our, our mandate, this is our work. And now we are thinking that there's a lot of technology has to be created, machine translation, which can just uh, you know, uh, uh, create a content from one language to another language, if they are trained on our vocabulary, our terminology. So education technology, uh, language technology uh, has to be created uh, because education technology or e-learning uh, cannot be efficient if it is not uh, you know, backed by artificial intelligence. So what exactly in uh, educational technology, uh, uh, e-learning of uh, uh, um, for all Indian languages, which will be, uh, you know, uh, bootstrapped with substantial artificial intelligence. Otherwise, this will not be successful. Language technology, we have to build these tools, uh, IO uh, tools, real-time machine translation, simplifying text, dialogue recognition, multimodal technology, resource creation, and we have to have our own algorithms, data centers, and of course, cost-effective, multilingual, flexible AI. So a round of uh, current developments in India, very quickly, uh, so three initiatives uh, from uh, Government of India, the Information Technology Ministry is talking about Bhashini, a speech-to-speech -speech machine translation project, and Principal Scientific Advisor of PM Modi is uh, uh, having an initiative where we are uh, uh, asking a startup companies, I'm also part of this committee, I'm part of both the committees actually, uh, asking our startup companies to uh, to do a language pair for machine translation. And MOE, uh, I'm actually heading uh, a commission in MOE right now, is uh, uh, doing this with AICTE uh, using our terminology. Indian Academia, uh, IITs, uh, major IITs, uh, uh, ISC Bangalore, etc., etc., doing a lot of AI and NLP work. And uh, uh, these are current major players, and of course, uh, these major minor keeps on happening. But uh, I've given you uh, kind of the, 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 the specialization. IIT Chennai for known for speech, IIT Delhi uh, for OCR, optical character recognition, IIT Bangalore online handwriting, IIT Bombay, MT, WordNet, etc., IIT Patna, machine translation again, JNU, language technology, resources, tools, CDAX, triple ITM, some major universities, Jadapur, etc. Industry, all of these guys, Microsoft, Google, Swift, Amazon, Samsung, etc., and I've, I've worked with many of them. And uh, uh, so I'll just quickly summarize what we have done at JNU. We've done machine translation projects, and language technology resource creation projects, a Sanskrit Hindi machine translation project, and shallow parser tools for Indian languages. That's it. Currently, I'm uh, concerning for Google uh, in uh, understanding the nuanced uses of. Hindi in the Eastern Hindi variety and making sure how uh, uh, tools like Google Assistant will capture these. And nuanced technology for keyboard, Kashmiri, SwiftKey for a lot of these languages, predictive keyboards. You can download SwiftKey and enable these languages. Online handwriting for Microsoft 2006 uh, and University of Pennsylvania, LDC for multimodal data. These eight uh, security sensitive languages. And I did uh, English to Urdu machine translation for Microsoft uh, Bing, so you can use our machine translation uh, English to Urdu, which has become smarter now after so many years. We have these monster tools, and uh, and uh, our students have uh, worked a lot of things. And then uh, currently we are focusing on summarizing text and having a natural language interface to programming languages like Sanskrit to Java in interface, and uh, automatic speech recognition, machine translation, etc. 
we do a lot of this uh, showcasing of our work and most of these seminars have been sponsored by Microservices so far. This is our website. And finally, uh, so uh, our progress uh, certainly depends in, on AI because we are a very diverse country and we have to administer a very complex, huge, multilingual, multicultural country. We have to reach out benefits of government policies to everybody in the remotest corner of the country. And that cannot happen without using AI because we have to employ deploy AI in governance, in education, in health, disaster management, languages, cultures, everything that you can think of. And that cannot happen unless we create resources in all Indian languages, including technical vocabulary and content. And we have, we have to build educational technology and NLP with common core. See, uh, Sanskrit has been uh, responsible for not only really spawning uh, uh, more languages in India, spawning new languages in India and Europe, right? See, more than 21 languages of Europe are considered, uh, you know, evolved from Sanskrit and almost all languages of India, you know, I would say, have either evolved or have been hugely influenced by Sanskrit. And so, therefore, the Sanskrit has influenced the grammar of all Indian languages. Sanskrit has influenced the vocabulary of Indian languages. Therefore, having Sanskrit as a common core will be a really a, a useful technologically, uh, uh, the such technology will be more scalable and, and cost, cost effective. We have to depend on its own strength of linguistic, philosophical, and traditional self for better AI. So we have to depend on our own, you know, linguistic and logical traditions to make sure our AI is more robust and caters to Indian needs and is more scalable. You know, India's own AI I have been always talking about, and India's own data centers very, very important. When I did this, when I did that multilingual project for building corpora for all Indian languages, we made sure that we have our own server. Uh, in JNU and uh, that would have a workspace for all the partners and they would be working right on our server. So no need to use any foreign or, or, or data centers or something which is not in India. So challenges are there, uh, India's diversity, uh, language variation and mixing. We have uh, standards lacking, uh, positive standards. Funding is always an issue and uh, we are very casual towards our languages. That's also an important factor. Um, you know, uh, lack of teamwork, certainly, uh, lack of competition and complexity of natural languages, uh, more so in multilingual societies like India. Our languages are very, very complex, more complex than perhaps any other language of the world. And challenges also in using AI itself in, in multilingual India. Because our linguistic and cultural diversity requires a much more robust and flexible and scalable AI than you would perhaps find. So our, so if you take a, a, an algorithm, for example, and we train a large uh, language model for India, obviously we have to retrain them continuously because language is changing far, with a faster rate in India than perhaps anywhere else because of the mixing that is happening, because of the cultural flexibility that we have in India. And AI itself is a challenge because AI has been changing uh, since 90s, I would say it's been changing faster. I remember doing a course in Introduction to Artificial Intelligence at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in 1997. And that course was titled Introduction to AI, but in, in fact, it was a course in programming in Prolog and programming in Lisp. Now, if you do a course in AI, it will be actually programming in uh, on Python, perhaps, and doing a lot of machine learning and machine learning. So with that, I'll uh, end my talk, and I can perhaps take a few questions, and I'll be very happy to answer some concerns and questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the concerns, sir. I, uh, I'm sure that we all agree that this talk is a uh, very comprehensive uh, description of why Panini is so important in uh, AI and linguistics. And also, uh, sir has uh, shown us the many opportunities, the challenges that AI is facing and the challenges also open up doors to opportunities for young people like us to work in this direction. And I, I'm sure that you uh, must have been by the talk that Sir has given here. And uh, I like the question mark that you have created at the end. Can you again flash that screen once more? Uh, just for everyone to appreciate once again. And uh, I will just open the floor to questions and I will uh, ask uh, uh, the audience to. Can you, can uh, you see that again? Can I... uh, no, it is not clear. Can you see the slide again, the question mark? No, the slide is not. Uh, oh, not wait, 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 let me share. Let me share. Let me share a screen. Okay, let me share my entire screen one more time. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Yes. I didn't see that now. Yep. Yep. So I think this is ka in all different languages. So have you covered all the twenty-two languages? Well, I no, no, no. The the, the Santali. A lot of languages use Devanagari. Santali has old Chikis. Old Chikis is not here. I think even Maitei, Maitei perhaps might not be here. Uh, yeah. So other scripts should be here. I believe. I can barely hear you actually. When you turn around, I mean, I can hear you clearly. When you when you turn back, I can't hear you. I think we should have the mic. Yeah, it's clearer now. I, I can't hear anything. I mean, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Can you hear me? Hello. When you turn around, I can hear you clearly. When you turn back, then uh, I can't. I can't hear you. There's some problem with the microphone, I believe. There. I can't hear you now. Hello. Can you hear me now? Very, very barely, even uh, not very clear. So the thing is, we are the same thing. But when you do your visuals, it's taking something. Your own speech. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, we are the same thing. My very point of view is, is it possible to bring this uh, language in a full frame, as a rational language? Is someone asking a question? I, I can't hear anything. You can write the question if uh, mic is not working. Hello? I think uh, the question yeah. is yeah. The, question, the question is that uh, we perform our rituals in Sanskrit, although we are quite diverse in our uh, regional languages. So, is it uh, possible that uh, we can have Sanskrit uh, as uh, a national language uh, in the future? Well, Sanskrit is a national language. Sanskrit is a scheduled language. Our constitution, 8th schedule, does not mention the word national. It only mentions 8th schedule, right? Sanskrit is a scheduled language as uh, other 21 languages are. And the fact that Sanskrit uh, uh, mantras are, are kind of pan-Indian, everywhere you hear Sanskrit mantras, why? Because see, uh, though we have uh, hundreds of languages in India, when it comes to education, doing things the proper way, we use a standard language, right? If we have to do puja in a standard way, we have to use some standard language. And therefore, Sanskrit has been used traditionally as a standard uh, 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 terminology or communication in pujas. <laughs> Can't hear, can't hear. Can you uh, speak the question again? So, huh? Hello. Can the question be repeated uh, by someone closer to mic? Can you repeat the question once? Yeah, please repeat the question. No, I can't hear. 
Hello. I will I will pass the question. You can ask the question now. Yeah, yeah. Now I can hear. You can tell me the question. I will I will pass it here. I can't hear. So the question is, uh, uh, we are having this institutes of, in the institutes of national importance like IIT and all. So can we uh, start teaching Sanskrit as a language in in place of humanities languages uh, yeah. for the first year students? Absolutely, absolutely, compulsory. See the the wiser universities of the world. For example, you know. Uh, uh, University of Urbana Champaign, where I went to school. I mean, one classical language is, is, is you know, compulsory for people to go through, and Sanskrit is one of them. You know, Sanskrit, Greek, Latin for uh, compulsory for people doing linguistics there. And uh, and many people of engineering schools, they do one classical language, you know. And here in India, because Sanskrit has so much of knowledge, and the Sanskrit grammar itself is, you know, uh, an engineering document. So I think uh, it should be compulsory for every engineering institute. You have Sanskrit. Why? Because, for example, do metallurgical sciences, do chemical sciences, physical sciences. You do, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, technology. Uh, there is a, a basic uh, foundational text in Sanskrit. For example, I did some research on Bhasma. You know, there is a Rasayan Sar text of the 20th century, written in 20th century Banaras, but it's an older text. I was I was uh, consulting University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, uh, 2009 to 12, three years. And my job was to uh, interpret uh, the Rasayan Sar text so that the students of uh, chemistry in that university could do PhD research. And we examined the Bhasma, you know, a technology that uh, our texts talk about so that we can create, you know, bioenhancers. So every text of Sanskrit, you know, a needs, uh, 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 needs to be examined very closely. And I had proposed in one of my talks somewhere that, for example, we take a text of engineering in Sanskrit and create a team of you know, scholars, a supervisor, the student, and industry, uh, three partners, and examine that text completely. And most likely we'll gain something out of it. If we don't gain anything out of it, fine, we did some wasteful exercise. But most likely something will come out of it. So that is, 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 the, is the advantage of teaching Sanskrit and having Sanskrit compulsorily in engineering and science institutes. I'm glad that you brought this question up. No, sir. Is, is, is. sir, am I audible? Yeah, now you're audible. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, I have two questions regarding Sanskrit with, with respect to artificial intelligence and scientific studies in a broader context. We have heard in a lot of cases and in some cases we have studied as well that uh, Sanskrit is a very scientific language and it makes uh, studying science and mathematics easy because uh, it breaks it down in very uh, uh, sim simple terminology. So, sir, the question is how, uh, if we have to implement this in our education system, how can we implement Sanskrit in a way that uh, it helps us inculcate more scientific temperament and scientific thinking? And my second question is that uh, regarding programming languages, uh, sir, which are the most appropriate programming languages for Sanskrit? I mean, I'm learning MATLAB right now. Is it a suitable one or are there more suitable languages, sir? Well, the first question, yes, uh, we can do that by making Sanskrit, uh, some aspects of Sanskrit, you know, a uh, uh, compulsory right from uh, the beginning in schools uh, uh, down to colleges and universities. And then when the students come to the university level, then they can be introduced to the, the technical uh, text in Sanskrit, the Shastras. And when they do Shastras in any discipline, they gain that knowledge of, you know, and and uh, uh, and then basically uh, do this AI kind of research. Now the, the question that how Sanskrit is a, a, a scientific language, all languages are scientific, right? But Sanskrit was kind of perfected. Uh, that's why it was called uh, Sanskrit, uh, refined. Sanskrit is more scientific than other languages because there was an, an, an a successive exercises of uh, uh, you know, by, by several grammarians to perfect the language. Why do we need a perfect language? Because so that everybody in this diverse, you know, a country from, uh, you know, Arunachal Pradesh to Iran and from Tibet to all the way Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia is able to communicate in one lingo. We needed a technical language that's why education can happen in one standard language. And therefore, Sanskrit became a very perfected language. 
And if we are able to construct a sentence in Sanskrit, it is easier for machines to parse it. Because there'll be less ambiguity. I won't say that there'll be no ambiguity, there'll be less ambiguity. And if Sanskrit is a perfected language, it can be uh, broken down with grammar roots easily. It will be very difficult to break down uh, languages like Hindi or English uh, in, in, in you know, uh, most fluent uh, 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 examples. Because there will be a lot of variations. There will be a lot of variations and a lot of ambiguities. So Sanskrit that way is very suitable for computing. And Sanskrit can perhaps replace a programming languages. And, and, and we did an exercise, pilot project as part of a PhD, where we uh, you know, did an interface with Sanskrit and Java. So we took some API of Java, not java.lang, maybe some other API of Java, and tried to uh, create Sanskrit statements, which could be directly used and compiler will compile the code into bytecode. So that was done, and that actually worked. So uh, the, and the second question, uh, the second question uh, was, I just forgot the second question. What was that second question? Can you repeat the question once? Yeah, the second question. So the second question. Hello. In education, you said perhaps? Hello? Can't, can't hear you. The second question was perhaps related to education or? Second question was related to I have a short buffer memory. Are you able to hear me now? No, I'm not able to hear. Now, are you able to hear me? No. Can't hear. It will turn towards the mic perhaps. Hello. Hello. Are you able to hear yeah, me now? Yeah, now, now able to hear. Yeah. Okay. So yes. the question, the question is that uh, um, by using uh, programming languages like MATLAB, uh -huh. uh, can Sanskrit be useful to uh, code in MATLAB or some other uh, programming languages? So which programming language is the closest one that we can adapt Sanskrit to code in? See, uh, any natural language, and more so Sanskrit, could be easily programmed using a logic uh, uh, language. For example, Prolog would have been, this would have been perhaps the best suited to uh, capture that. But now uh, there are more commercial languages. You know, MATLAB, you give an example. And I would say even Python or Java, it can be used uh, you know, uh, to parse Sanskrit sentences better than perhaps parse English and other sentences. Okay. And uh, the experiment we did, uh, or the pilots we did uh, in, uh, in mapping, Sanskrit to Java also worked very well. So you can perhaps uh, refer to uh, the thesis of uh, Dr. Kabi Khanganba, uh, who did a PhD in this in this in this topic. He's working in an AI company in Bangalore. So you can read his PhD thesis, and he exactly did uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, no, uh, um, uh, comparing uh, rather rather you know interfacing uh, Sanskrit with Java. So I would say ideally uh, you know some uh, logic language, but these logic languages are not the dominant languages these days. Uh, but any language could be could be good. If you are doing, you know, uh, some, I would say, uh, uh, I believe uh, the the portions of Sanskrit doing dealing with uh, Navinyai perhaps could be handled better with with MATLAB. Uh, but uh, other aspects could be handled by other languages. I think. Okay, so I think uh, we don't have other questions from the audience. Uh, I have one question from my side. Yep. So, um, we are talking about the linguistic abilities of Sanskrit or the linguistic characteristics of Sanskrit. So, uh, it is often heard that uh, if we continue uh, speaking in Sanskrit, learn Sanskrit and speak in Sanskrit, uh, our mental development or there are some windows of our mind opens up and we can acquire uh, knowledge or grasp knowledge or uh, we develop intuition uh, better. Uh, so, is there any formal uh, research available in this uh, direction? And is there a capability of uh, uh, linguistics to uh, actually um, uh, open up the locks of closed doors of our mind? There's one research done by, I think, the uh, National Brain Research Institute uh, in, in Manessa. And they have worked on uh, 
the you know languages with richer sound systems like indian north indian language mostly i would say uh, sanskrit is is an example where we have a range of sounds uh, vowels and, and consonants and in sanskrit every vowel can have 18 kinds 18 varieties right uh, panay talks about each vowel has 18 shades so it's a very rich uh, uh, system of sound so if you are able to pronounce a sanskrit text correctly then you are hitting all various portions of your oral cavity oral cavity and therefore you are able to tickle your brain the maximum possible way every day so that not only keeps you healthy but also keep your brain more active perhaps i mean there have been researches where say the multilingual communities are more uh, i mean they're smarter we don't know the definition of being smarter but their brain is uh, always challenged you know in, in doing parsing thing parsing concepts in parallel so they perhaps develop more cells, more neurons to do that. And in Sanskrit, when you, when you actually uh, uh, speaking uh, texts with all these, you know, uh, chandas, meters, and, and accents, then you are possibly trying to utter all possible kinds of sound systems that human language can generate. And that perhaps is an example of, you know, uh, keeping a very active and healthy brain. And that is only uh, which, which I can say, though, you know, uh, um, being cognitively more able and less able uh, could be very complex questions. But I can say that if you are able to challenge your brain more on a daily basis by uttering these mantras, you know, uh, periodically, regularly, with their proper pronunciations, then certainly you're challenging your brain in a much more uh, consistent manner every day. Uh, thank you, Professor Jha, for this wonderful session. And uh, I'm sure that we'd be happy to have you physically sometime over here with all your rich experience and knowledge to share with all of us. Uh, so I think we can have a round of applause for the uh, brilliant talk interaction that we had. Well, I have been to your campus at least twice, I think, to the HSS department. For, uh, okay, some, uh, some sir, I had not been informed that time. Otherwise, I would definitely have come to meet you. So next time, definitely we would catch up. Uh, Professor Anil was also here physically, but he had to uh, go somewhere for some other uh, duties. Uh, I, I think uh, we can end this lecture by uh, with a vote of thanks. Uh, so we thank uh, Professor uh, Jha for uh, sharing his valuable experience and knowledge and for giving us time for this talk. Um, and uh, I am sure that we are um, now having much uh, more exposure to understanding how Sanskrit is uh, useful in uh, our technical domain as well. And we would like to explore that side as well. And uh, uh, I also uh, thank all of you to be here in spite there is the Holy Week. Uh, this week is the Holy Week, but you are still here and uh, you have come here to express your interest in this uh, um, topic of Sanskrit, AI and linguistics. So with that, I would like to end up the lecture. Thank you, Professor Jha, again.